So actually, it is really my pleasure to uh, put this portion of the, uh, of the uh, day in uh, Al Kaufman's hands. Uh, he will talk to us about how this panel will run. Um, I want you to think about what they will have to say because it will become a part of our table discussions as well. So thank you all uh, for hanging in and being so focused and uh, uh, being so ready to keep moving forward. Let me turn things over to Al, uh, Al Kaufman as we talk about uh, this uh, panel of discussants. Well, thank you very much. It's always wonderful to work with IDRA. And let me tell Dr. Castellanos, you're very lucky. I've seen Bradley uh, cut off Henry Cisneros when he, when he went past his time. And Henry was absolutely amazed. I think, uh, uh, I don't think even President Clinton would shut off Henry Cisneros like that. But, uh, so it's a wonderful group here. Uh, my name is Al Kaufman, and I've been given the great honor of uh, introducing this, this panel. Um, we have uh, Ms. Martha Alonso who's a uh, ELL transition teacher, Ms. Lonto, here. And uh, everybody, you can go ahead and clap. I'm not there. We have uh, Veronica Alvarez, who's a uh, bilingual at the Department of Harlandale, right here. Thank you. We have Dr. Rogelio Sainz from UTSA. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Avalaro Saavedra, uh, who's the superintendent of South Sand. And Dr. Julian Vasquez Heilig from uh, now from California, but from Texas for many years, uh, PhD, who's now at California State as expert on bilingual ed. Please sit up. So I thought I I wanted to open the discussion first of all with a, a very quick summary of what uh, Dr. Uh, what Oscar has found for us. First of all, schools that spend more money do better for ELL students. That's subtle, that's true, and that's what he found. And secondly, all schools are doing badly. Uh, very few are meeting even the Texas very low standards for what ELL students should learn. So those are our two major factors, and uh, that is what he found. And I think to some extent we want to talk about the fine points of his study among the five of us. Um, I've had a little background with this issue. Uh, in 1974, I met Dr. Jose Cardenas who was really rebounding from the great loss we had at the US Supreme Court in the Rodriguez case. And we were walking to lunch and I said, well, why are you doing this bilingual ed? Why this instead of other things? He said, well, Al, we lost it. We lost the Rodriguez case, but we're gonna win it bit by bit. We're gonna do bilingual ed, and then we're gonna do migrant education, then we're gonna do early childhood education, um, then we're gonna do uh, women's rights, and we're gonna take it step by step. And he said, I think it'll probably take a few years to do each one. Well, it's 40 years later, we're still working on the first one, but uh, uh, many of us are behind what Jose Cardenas wanted to do. Under Jose's uh, tutelage, and or rather kicks in the rear, uh, Maldef went back and filed the USV Texas bilingual education case in 1975. Uh, that case was developed and Jose and IDRA helped get all the information together for that case, including the interrogatories. Um, that was tried uh, by Norma Cantu, Peter Roos, and Roger Rice, and Dr. Jose Cardenas was the major expert witness in that case. That case by Judge Justice adopted basically the Cardenas plan for bilingual education in the state of Texas, which required complete content instruction K through 12, uh, complete access to bilingual education from pre-K through the 12th grade. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Judge Justice said. When it got to the Texas legislature, as you might guess, they weakened it a bit. They almost completely eviscerated it. Uh, uh, Senator Carlos Chuan, one of our, our, our great champions of the time, and my hat's off to Jose Rodriguez, I think, for carrying on this mantle. Uh, uh, Chuan, Senator Chuan, filed the bill, pushed it through. Dr. Albert Cortez was one of the people who was advocating for it. And that bill finally became what is now Senate Bill 477, the basic structure of bilingual education uh, in Texas. Um, then that became an important part of the state plan, which of course was influenced by the federal government. I got to work at the Office for Civil Rights and the state plan became the guts of what they would require every school district in the state of Texas to do under the ESAA. Now, wonder who really wrote the 
bill, Senate Bill 477. I'm sure that Senator Carlos Truan went out and went into his study and sat down and wrote it with other senators, and they discussed what is best for Texas. Well, that's one view. Those of you who've ever spent any time around the Texas legislature, so no, that's not how it happens. So what happened was at the dinner table of Dr. Gloria Zamora of IDRA, Dr. Zamora and uh, Roger Rice and Albert Cortez, and I think Mary Esther Bernal or Joe Bernal might have been there, sat around the table and wrote basically what is Senate Bill 477. So that's how you've got what you've uh, got now. Now, I uh, have had the chance to look at some of these factors through the years, and a bilingual education has improved, believe it or not, from what it was in the late 70s, but there's still major problems in it. And we have uh, David Hinojosa here from Maldef, who's been the legal champion of this issue now for the last 10 years and has fought like you know what to try to get Texas into the 21st century, maybe even to the 20th century, uh, to have a good bilingual education program. He's been indefatigable in that. We greatly appreciate it. So now I want to go ahead with uh, speakers. And uh, I'm going to ask them to, to stay to 10 minutes, and I'm going to uh, have the Bradley of the past. In 10 minutes, he's going to cut you off like you were, like you were Henry Cisneros. Okay. So let me go ahead and start with Ms. Alonzo, please. If you want to stay here, just come up here. Watch your here if you like. Sure. Okay. Oh, hello, my name is Martha Alonso. I'm currently the ELL uh, transition coach at Stevens High School with Northside ISD. And I have a prior experience teaching ESL students. I was the ESL teacher at Rhodes Middle School from San Antonio ISD. I'm also currently working on my PhD at the University of the Incarnate Word, and I'm working on my dissertation. So a lot of this uh, presentation uh, shed light uh, with statistics as to uh, my current research. I'm able to tie in what I've learned from um, the literature as well as um, real world experience in working with ELL students. Um, when I worked at Rhodes, our population looked very similar to the statistics. We had a large um, long-term ELL population and a smaller newcomer um, population, and it mirrors the same thing at Stevens High School. So um, with the uh, funding, I, uh, I know that um, most of the schools are, are trying to provide that support, and we're able to see that in the, in the classrooms. Feel that you have the funding you need in your school to provide the program for kids, especially secondary ELL. Um, so currently at Stevens, um, at our principal, he's been able to use some of our Title money, Title One money, to be able to provide support for our students. And the support that we're providing for our students is tutors in the classroom. So we send our tutors into the core content areas to be able to support our ELL students in the classrooms. So that's one of the ways that um, we're using some of our funding to provide um, support for our ELL students. And I know that's something new that not all the campuses are doing. So it's um, the principal's support for the program is very important in order for us to receive that support. And um, we are, the district as a whole, um, uh, they, they, they created a new job position and it's, which is the one I'm in, it's the ELL transition coach. And basically we work uh, with the teachers to be able to, um, train them and be able to work with these types of students. Because a lot of the times, the teachers do not have that ELL endorsement or that ESL endorsement to be able to adequ adequately provide the instruction that the students need. So being able, to, um, being able to have that position and train teachers to be able to provide that support will ultimately help them overall. Let me just ask you one more question. Uh, 
what do you think you would need to provide even a better education for your ELL students, especially the very recent arrivals? Well, our recent arrivals do receive a lot of um, support already. Um, they do have some sheltered classes and they have um, tutors that are more permanent than the tutors that um, we currently added with our Title I money. So those are a little bit temporary depending on the funding is how long we're actually able to keep them. So um, definitely having more funding to be able to provide that support, uh, that, that tutor support in the classrooms makes, uh, makes a lot of difference. The tutors work with these kids in small group and that's a lot of the times what they need is that small group support to where they feel comfortable enough to ask questions and to, um, clarify any misunderstandings that they have. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Ms. Alvarez. Good morning, my name is Veronica Alvarez. I'm the bilingual ESL coordinator at Harlan Leo ISD. And I thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, several things kind of came up with the presentation and everything that was said. Um, in terms of local funding, we do need more support. Um, as I have gone and visited uh, campuses and districts, um, we have, for example, one campus in particular that we went to go visit, and when we went and visited, they had three ESL teachers. Our campus that has probably the same number of ELLs, if not even more, has one ESL teacher. So clearly we can see um, how students are supported and um, in terms of funding. But because that district is a bigger district, they receive more funding. And so um, equitable services in terms of um, interventions. Um, resources has come up as one of the biggest things for us. Um, seeing equitable resources for our students. Uh, we do not see a lot of products in terms of Spanish products. Equitable Spanish, good quality Spanish, content vocabulary Spanish that we need for our students. Um, there needs to be also some type of push for those types of equitable services. Um, I'm very fortunate that our district, we have our leadership that does support us a lot, but also at the same time, we could see that without the funding and the resources, we're not gonna have that equal um, opportunities for our students. Um, in terms of, I can see right now that we have the 0.1, and I know that the push is now 0.5. Why not one? Why not one point? I mean, if we can see our special ed five times more support, why are we not seeing that support for our ELLs? Um, in our district in particular, we are over 2,500 ELLs at our district. And how can we support them more? Our elementary, yes, is our bigger um, terms of students. Our secondary, we have about 900 students. However, there, we do have a lot of recent arrivals. And so how can we support them in terms of the support that they need? Um, Curriculum is also a big piece for us as well in terms of um, finding and, and having the teachers work. Teachers are um, kind of stretched thin right now in terms of, the, of everything that they're doing. Now with our new testing of STAR, uh, we can see teachers are, are stressed to the minimum with that. So when we want to create things, even district, um, that's very difficult because we're trying to pull them after school or trying to pull them in to do that, but we also don't want to take them away from the students. So how do we cre create this quality work um, and, you know, being able to pull our teachers either after school or in the summer months? Um, so again, equitable for, in terms of that. Um, I do want to acknowledge because without my um, staff and who's in the room, if y'all can stand up really quickly, my staff, I know y'all are like, I can't believe <laughs> But I want to acknowledge them. Three of them, and we're missing two others, work primarily in the secondary setting. Um, we do now have starting to branch out into our elementary setting. Um, but they can tell you first, just being there at the campuses, what the students go through. I could share so many stories with you of the fights that we fight for our students. Um, one person in particular that I'm looking at right now who was told that the student had to go to an alternative center because she was the only student that was taking tax. And now they wanted her to go to an alternative center. So we, we fight the battle every day for our students. Um, we fight the battle for our parents as well. Um, our parents want to be and they want support. 
and we are there for support for them. And so in terms of what we can do to also help um, empower our parents in terms of funding is also very important as well. Uh, without our parents and our parents understanding their rights and what they can do, um, and we are those uh, supporters at our district. Thank you and thank you for the work that you do. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, I have one or two just quick questions. Do you, uh, do you have the uh, materials for your ELL students secondary level uh, in content areas in Spanish or all the courses available to other students? We are working on several pieces. One, uh, we are fortunate this year we have our dual language program who's now moved into sixth grade. And so at that campus in particular, all the materials are there. Why? Because we were able to kind of get prepared for that. At our other campus, especially our high schools, we do not. And so, and a part of that is adoptions are old. Um, things are coming up new. We how we recently are going to what get the social studies and then the lote uh, teachers of other languages. Theirs has been for a long time. And so, um, in terms of the support they need as well. But um, in terms of for our recent arrivals, we don't have everything. We need. Dr. Sines, I saw Dr. Sines at a forum on immigration. Before that, I saw him one on health. So. He's really very active in the community now. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, we were asked to um, address the important issues for policymakers that comes out of, uh, of this research, uh, what it means for our own particular research uh, and that of others in our fields, as well as what are the next questions uh, that we need to, to consider. I will speak of, uh, of the work of uh, Dr. Jimenez Castellanos, as a sociologist, demographer, and public policy specialist. I've conducted demographic um, uh, analysis examine, examining the demography of Latino children, as well as the state of Latino children in the country. And one of the, uh, some of the patterns that come out is the importance of Latinos for the future of the United States. Increasingly, uh, the, uh, the, the workforce in, in the United States will be increasingly Latinos, and we have our kids today growing up uh, and joining the labor force. Uh, and it is also, uh, it addresses also the uh, policy implications that come about if we do not address the, the educational needs of Latino children, the cost that we pay for not educating our youth uh, um, uh, and in order to uh, be productive citizens in, uh, in the coming uh, labor force that is increasingly technological and global. Thus, in, in this research, there is an important dimension that comes from the intersection between demography and education. Yet my research, and also that of uh, uh, demographer colleagues, tends to examine Latino children as a whole. While it recognizes the diversity of Latino children with respect, for example, to native uh, nativity status, where, where children were born, uh, poverty, socioeconomic status, and so forth, as well as language, uh, there has not been much attention specifically to English language learners, uh, which as uh, Dr. Jimenez Castellanos' research clearly demonstrates that this group represents one of the fastest growing segments of the K through 12 population. Statistics such as, quote, one in nine of US students are learning, Eng uh, are learning English as a second language, and that this statistic is one in six in Texas, amply demonstrate the significance of this population. Demographers then will need to consider directly English uh, language learners in order to more fully comprehend the social, economic, demographic, and educational realities of Latino children. The research that is being highlighted here today also represents a clarion call uh, for policymakers in Texas about the major need to ag address the gaping inequities uh, that continue in the field of education that continue to characterize the funding of education in the state and the need to invest in the education of, of uh, English lang language learners and more broadly in Latino children. Indeed, among Latino children, the group that I consider the engine of the US population as well as the Texas population, English language learners in particular are embedded, are living in extremely poor neighborhoods, poor schools, and poor communities that make it very challenging and costly to overcome these barriers in order to put them closer 
to to uh, to the uh, equalizing the playing field academically. As Dr. Jimenez Castellanos notes, unfortunately, he says, quote, uh, ELLs tend to experience high rates of poverty, higher mobility rates, attend segregated, underfunded, and unsafe schools compared to their non-ELL counterparts, close quote. Dr. Jimenez Castellanos' research shows that English language learners do best in schools that are high achieving and that are also well funded. The bill to educate these children is not cheap. Unfortunately, the mentality of many policymakers is that, quote, we can't throw money at the problem. As Jonathan Kozel, author of many books, including Savage Inequalities, asserts, quote, middle and upper class parents don't have problems throwing money at, uh, at the education of their children. The reality is that it is cheaper to invest in the education of English language learners and more broadly Latino children today than it, is, than it will be to pay in the near future for the fallout of the failure to do so. Dr. Jimenez Castellanos' research also supports uh, work of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce white paper that, is, that w recently was released titled The Impact of Education on Economic Development in Texas, which IDRA as well as UTSA collaborated on that paper. And the white paper calls attention in particular to the importance of addressing the educational needs of English uh, um, uh, language uh, learners and Latino children. Uh, finally, I want to ad address the implications of the research from the perspective of race and inclusion. The issue of race is increasingly masked, diluted, and made invisible. After all, many argue that we are beyond race, uh, that race has no, uh, no longer matters, and that in the field of education and inequality, that has nothing to do with race. We are living in a time when it is taboo to mention race despite the five-ton pink elephant in the middle of the living room. Many policymakers and members of the general pub public continue to see English language uh, learners as well as Latino children as not our children but their children and see them as a liability instead of an asset. Comments such as, we can't throw money at the problem uh, for those children are couched in time-worn stereotypes and images of uh, English Latino learners as well as Latino children as people who are incapable of learning and succeeding. There needs to be a transformation uh, involving policymakers shifting the view uh, of these children as their children and to embrace these uh, kids as our children. There needs to be a, a view supported by resources and high expectations that every English language learner, every Latino child, every African American child is capable of excelling academically. In the end, given demographic trends, it is obvious that in the future, uh, that the future of uh, English uh, language learners and more broadly Latino children is tied to the fortunes of uh, the country as well as, uh, as uh, the, the fortunes of Texas, or rather, the, the fortunes of Texas and, and the country are very much tied to what happens with Latino kids. And if we fail to uh, educate kids today, that is going to have a massive uh, impact on, on the economy, for example, and, uh, and the fortunes of the, the country and, and the state. Uh, and as Senator Rodriguez pointed out, that there needs to be these partnerships that emerge between the business community, for example, uh, educational leaders, policymakers, parents, and activists. Uh, and in the end, then, what we have is, in terms of looking at the demographic future, you really have a country that is going to be increasingly Latino, and today's Latino kids being the workforce, for example, the citizens, the engaged citizenry of the country in, in, the, coming, in the coming decades. And we're going to see, just like the baby boomers impacted each institution as they grew from, from babies, for example, impacting the diaper industry all the way now as baby boomers are retiring and impacting the uh, health industry. So too, with Latino children, you see the impact that they're going to have on the educational system in terms of colleges such as Our Lady of the Lake uh, University, UTSA, and others uh, are increasingly going to be drawing from children uh, and youth that are increasingly uh, Latinos. 
in terms of the economy, the workforce, entrepreneurs, and so forth, will increasingly be drawing from uh, uh, people who are Latinos, the healthcare industry, even in religion, we see the demographic shifts that have taken place, and we see some religions, for example, or some Catholic churches, for example, in the Northeast, losing uh, uh, congregants uh, because of the aging of the white population, and we see also the uh, the transfer, the um, uh, the movement of many Latinos, Catholics, for example, to other religions, particularly Protestant and and, uh, um, and uh, evangelicals, as you see the the uh, recruitment of this growing population, and you also see it on, on, the, on the political scene. So uh, in sum, then, in terms of looking at the future of uh, Latinos, uh, whether we have a brighter future or, a, or a, uh, one that, is, uh, that continues to be uh, characterized by uh, poverty, inequality, and so forth, uh, it depends very heavily on decisions that are being made in Austin, in Washington, D.C., in terms of coming up with solutions to, uh, uh, to better educate Latino children as well as uh, English language uh, uh, learners. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Saavedra. Uh, he and I used to, uh, we never lobbied, but we were both uh, in Austin to inform legislators. <laughs> yeah, we were never effective at it. Anyway, uh, we had representatives of the uh, El Paso, Houston, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, the Valley Districts were all there trying to give information. Since then, Dr. Saavedra has been the superintendent, I think, in Corpus Christi, uh, and then in Houston. Uh, and now he thought he would retire, but instead he's the superintendent of South San, which for the first time gives him a chance to really serve. Thank you, Al, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank Idra for inviting me to participate in this program. Uh, uh, as Al dated me, uh, I go back a, lot, a long time. Uh, uh, Albert Cortez as well. We used to walk the, the halls of the, the Capitol back in the 80s and uh, into the early 90s. And uh, so I've been around a long time. I was at midwinter, for some of you school folks, I was at midwinter a few weeks ago, actually last week, I guess it was. And uh, every, every few minutes, somebody would stop me. And someone from my staff said, you know, a lot of people know you. Well, when, you, when you're as old as I am and you've been around so long, a lot of people know you. So uh, that, that's, what's, what's, that's what's happened to me. Um, let me talk a little bit about my experiences with uh, ELL students and bilingual students and serving them in, uh, in three different districts now. Uh, my, time in, my time in Corpus Christi, I spent 28 years in Corpus Christi, started my teaching career in Corpus Christi and became superintendent 20 years later and served uh, seven or eight more, more years uh, after that before moving on to Houston. But Corpus Christi is a, is a, is a community with uh, the school district having about 68% of the population of the, of the school district being Hispanic. But we only had about 6% of our population were, were identified ELL bil bilingual. And that really always troubled me because I always felt that that was an extremely low percentage when your population is 68%. And, but then I start looking at my special ed percentages. And my, at that time, I have no idea what it is today, but at that time, the special ed uh, uh, students or percentage of students identified was something like 14 to 16%. When the state average was at that time, even today, about nine to 10% as special ed. So that told me that instead of identifying them into the ELL uh, uh, bilingual program, they were being pushed off into the uh, special ed program. All right. So in my seven years there as superintendent, we worked very hard to try to turn that around. And again, I have no idea what those percentages are today, but those are the type of things that happen um, in, in, in school district uh, all, all over the state, frankly, all, all over the country. And, and I won't say, at least, at least through my experience in Corpus, in that particular experience, I won't say it was necessarily intentional. Sometimes it's simply lack of knowledge on the part of, of people working, working with these children, identifying these children. Um, but um, anyway, that, that, that does happen. I move, I move, on, to, I move on to Houston, and in Houston I served five years as a superintendent, and that population of, of Hispanics in the school district was actually a lower per, per, percent. It was 58% uh, 
of the, of the uh, population of, of in, in, in HISD was, was Hispanic, but the, uh, the percent of identified bilingual ELL students was 28 to 30 percent, which is more like it. You know, that's, that's, but there's also another difference. Another difference being in comparing communities and comparing actually San Antonio as well is some communities have a higher percent, a higher percent of Hispanics in, in the community, but they're not necessarily mostly first generation Hispanics. The generation of Hispanics that live in the community makes a difference. Uh, in Corpus Christi, certainly we had some first generation Hispanics, but many of the Hispanics in Corpus Christi were second, third, fourth, and fifth generation Hispanics that had been around a long time, had assimilated into, into the community, into the schools, and so forth. So that, make, that makes some difference. Houston, on the other hand, is predominantly first generation Hispanics for the most part. I mean, yes, they're second and third and so forth, but when you start talking about the large numbers, it's, it's, uh, it's first generation. And, and the reason is that Houston is one of the main uh, intake centers, quite frankly, that's where, well, that's where immigration lands, and, 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 and it's one of the main ones, at least more so than even Dallas, Texas. Uh, and about, about three-fourths three of the immigrants that land in Houston uh, move on to other areas of the country, but a fourth stays within the community. And you, you do that for many, many, many years. That's why you start to see Houston becoming uh, a predominantly, or has become a predominantly Hispanic community uh, with predominantly first generation Hispanics, a much greater need for serving ELL and, and bilingual, bilingual students. Uh, uh, within that very large district, the largest in the, in the state, we had about 200,000 kids and about 55, 56,000 of them, of those students were, were uh, ELL, identified ELL bilingual students. Uh, we had numerous programs, transition of course, dual language, and one of the things that we started during my administration there was uh, we opened up a newcomer school. You know, we started to realize that the children that were, that were coming in uh, as, uh, as through immigration, at one time, at one time they were, they were coming in with families and they were elementary children. But back in the, uh, when, when I was there between 04 and, and 09, uh, many of these young people were coming by themselves. And we continue to see that today, older young people by themselves. 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, not with families, but by themselves. Uh, we identified that we had many of these young people um, within the community. So we decided that we would try to open up a newcomer's school specifically designed for, for, the, for these kids. Um, limited funding, of course, prevented us from opening up a, a, a big center. Uh, but we, we started with a program that was, was to serve 125 young people. And we really thought that many of the young people that we were already serving within our 30 high schools in Houston would basically come over to that center. But when we opened up registration, the very first day we opened up registration, we had a line of over 300 young people wanting to enroll into this program. And none of them were coming from our schools. We were still serving the ones that were in our schools. These were people, young people in our community, came to work, you know, we did a good job, I guess, of putting the word out, publicizing the opening of the Newcomer Center, and they wanted to get an education as well. And uh, obviously, that first year, we had to limit it to 125. That's where, where our, how far our funding would take us. But we eventually grew that program to about 200 before I left, and I believe it's at about 250 today. But there's a great need for that type of program, uh, not only in Houston, but quite frankly, in, in all large metropolitan areas in, 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 the, in the state of, 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 of Texas. Uh, then I move on to South Sand. Uh, I, thought I, I thought I wanted to retire in 09. And uh, actually, I stayed busy. I, I taught at A&M College Station for a while. Uh, did a lot of consulting. I was asked to, uh, uh, to serve an interim time as a superintendent at South Sand as they looked for, for a superintendent. Uh, they asked me to stay. And, and honestly, I started to enjoy it. And uh, I, I felt that like as, as, as Al said, I was finally serving the people. You know, this is a different assignment than I've ever had, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, at South San, a school district of about 10,000, 96% uh, of our students are Hispanic, so that's that's about as Hispanic as you can get. And uh, we're certain we're in our identified group is about 15%, low I think. Yes, 
you got to consider the first generation, second, third, fourth generation issue that I talked about. But I still think we're under identifying our, our population. I don't believe we're, 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 we are where we need to be. Uh, South San is a, is a district with many challenges. This happens to be just one of many, many challenges. Uh, matter of fact, we were flipping bilingual directors as fast as we were flipping superintendents. But now, but now we have a, a great Arla Chapas here with, with me. Uh, she's our, our bilingual director, and, and she's going to she's going to stay around as long as I'm staying around. So uh, uh, anyway, so we, we hope to make make a, a difference there uh, to uh, to better. Uh, uh, identify the, the, the young people. Identification becomes a problem. Uh, Bradley, tell, give me, give me the, 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 the sign when I've got two minutes, okay? Uh, I'm, I, I am at two minutes. Can I borrow some of the other time folks didn't take? Okay, all right. So, um, so the issue of, of under-identifying many times occurs for two reasons. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the institution, although that plays a role sometimes. Many times, parents don't want their children identified as bilingual children. I, I encountered that not only in South Side, I encountered it in Houston uh, a lot. You know, there, there's a lot of pride that their children will not be labeled bilingual students, you know. Although in Houston, we had, we had research, we, the, as big as the district is, our research department actually had, had data that showed that if your children came into the bilingual program, ELL program, early on, second, third grade, their likelihood of succeeding at, at the high school level was much greater than those students that should have been that should have gone into the program but did not. And we had, we were able to make those comparisons, and, and we worked hard to try to get the parents to understand that this was best for their children. We would exit them as soon as they were ready to be exited, but they needed to, to receive the services. The other the other caveat, and I think I'm, I'm facing some of this at South San, our principals many times do not want to identify them as bilingual or ELL. And it has to do with the idea of balancing your classes, specifically at the elementary, you know. Uh, how many, how many uh, bilingual ELL students do you have in order to, to serve, uh, uh, to, to uh, put, the, put a classroom together? And uh, no one likes the, the split classes. And so there's issues there as well. I mean, those are some of the challenges that, that, that we face. But uh, let me talk real quickly about the, the money part, because I know that's the, the purpose of, of, of this uh, program today. But one of the things that I want to say concerning money, th this is in your, in your program here. Uh, and when you start to look at these two big circles here at the bottom, it really talks about the difference. It's comparing the amount of money that's spent in classrooms in the 100, 100 richest classrooms versus the 100 lowest. It's $27,000. Now, it, until you start making, put it into perspective, it doesn't really mean much. $27,000 is 50% of a teacher's salary, meaning the, the, the 100 wealthiest districts could increase their teaching staff 50% over the lowest and, 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 uh, and provide better services. I mean, it's a real significant difference when you start look, looking at it from, from that perspective. And the last thing I'll say is, is that I think we're facing some real challenges, even more so today than we ever have, mainly pr primarily because of the conservative attitude and, and leanings that we have in, in the state capital today. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, issue of, of, uh, the issue of immigration and, and, and the conserv conservative opinion in reference to uh, immigration, it's going to continue to, to, to uh, push back on, on this uh, work that we're trying to do to, to obtain additional funding uh, for bilingual ELL students. You know. Uh, but it doesn't mean we give up. We just need to be able to recognize that those challenges are, the, are there, and we need to be able to strategize as to what's the, uh, uh, the best way to, to be successful to obtain additional funding for, for these programs. Thank you very much. I have, I have one quick question for, uh, for Dr. Saavedra. Uh, Dr. Saavedra, if the weight for bilingual education were 0.5 instead of 0.1, thus school would get much higher amounts of funding for each one, do you think that would encourage principals to identify the students and encourage the districts? It's a loaded <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, no, 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 ab absolutely. Uh, of course that would make a difference. But you know, as, as we talk about the weights, whether it's whether the increase ought to be to 0.25 or 0.50, you know, really what we ought to be looking at is looking at the uh, educational needs for the diversity of, 
uh, ELL students that we have. As, you know, as, 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 as the researcher stated, there's different types of ELL students. They have different needs. The special ed lobby did a great job back in the 60s uh, to be able to, to set up their funding based on need. And that's why you see special ed weights from, I don't know, 0.20 to 4.0, whatever it may be. Uh, that's the kind of weight system I think that we need for bilingual students as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Julian Vasquez Heilig. So it's totally unfair to go after all of these esteemed folks. How do you bring it home? Uh, so first I want to say thank you to each of you for dedicating your lives to students. Thank you to the educators in this room. Thank you to the stakeholders in this room. There's so many other endeavors that you could be doing, but you're here because you care about kids. Thank you for that. Second, I want to say hello to Dr. Oscar. I had a chance to look through uh, the summary before I came. Um, one interesting thing about us is we're working on a special issue around education finance. And we're trying to gather some of the uh, uh, best minds around the country to engage with this issue in a non-traditional way. Folks who haven't traditionally done school finance work uh, in, in academia and to put some new uh, thoughts around this issue. So I, I look forward to working with him on that in the future. Second, uh, if you're a tweeter, please tweet at me uh, during my uh, one hour of comments. Wait, <laughs> ten, 10 minutes, right? When you get your PhD, they say you can speak no less than one hour, but I only have 10 minutes today. Um, and then also let me just say, one of the things that really stuck out to me in the, in the findings was that 60% of schools did not have a cell size large enough for uh, reporting of data which aligns with a conversation that we had at Brown at 60. Last year when we had a Brown v. Board at 60 anniversary, the media was engaged with this idea of segregation. And at that time, we had released a study that we called triple segregation. What do we mean by triple segregation is that not only are, do we see segregation by race, segregation by class, but also segregation of ELLs. I work for Houston ISD. I don't know if I ever told you that, Dr. Phaedra. We also have in common that we're Michigan Wolverines. We are. Uh, right. Yes. And so I worked for Rod Page and Research and Accountability back in the late 1990s. And we saw that in particular high schools, you have concentrations of students. In particular elementary schools, you have concentrations of students that are ELLs. Uh, that's just the, the way that neighborhoods work in the state. There's lots of segregation. And ELLs, we, we don't think about it that much, but ELLs are highly segregated across the state. And that's what you see in this test score data, is that 60% uh, uh, of these uh, schools are not reporting cells large enough. That's because ELLs are triple segregated. And you can see that if you just type into Google, type in triple segregation, and then my last names. I didn't have much say in my name. People ask me that all the time. I have two last names. So if you type in my two last names, the study will come up if you, in case you're interested in that. And we look at triple segregation across the state of Texas. Second, of course money matters. Of course it does. If you walk into a supermarket and you want to walk out with a pizza, you need, at least legally, you need to have some money, right? So, and one of the things that Dr. Sines mentioned, he mentioned Dr. Kozel's work, which is that, well, money only doesn't matter when we're talking about poor kids. When we're talking about Westlake, money matters. When we're talking about Northwestern San Antonio, Money matters. But when we're talking about the poor kids in central cities, all of a sudden money doesn't matter. And as Dr. Saavedra mentioned, the money adds up. Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Oscar talked about how there's this $1,000 gap between high-performing ELL schools and low-performing ELL schools. And, and he talked about the $27,000. So that's tens of thousands of dollars, even though $800 or $100 per pupil does not seem like a lot of money. On the classroom level, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. When you're talking about an entire school, you're now talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. When you're talking about a district, you're now talking millions of dollars. And money buys things, folks. Money buys certified teachers. It buys experienced teachers. One of the things that we noticed when I worked in research and accountability is that we'd have a lot of teachers come into Houston. They would cut their teeth in some of our toughest schools, and then they'd go off to Sugar Land then they go off to Katy, right? They would cut their teeth 
on our kids, our black and brown kids, and then they move on because there was more opportunity, better pay, the schools were nicer, et cetera, in other places. Money does buy things. You know, I spent eight years at the University of Texas. Uh, one of, you know, eight wonderful years, except for, you know, conversations that we had about Michigan football and Texas football, everything else I enjoyed. Um, and one of the things I, you know, I was able to do when I was here is attend a lot of think tanks, Texas Public Policy Foundation, you know, conversations. Those always stress me out. I had to have Amy's ice cream every time I went to a TPPF event afterwards. <laughs> and, um, and so what's interesting is that there are some folks in the state that are very proud that we're in the bottom five states in spending per pupil. They're very proud about that. And the Florida people and the Texas people, they compete with each other talking about how little they spend on education per pupil. Have you ever been to these events where they are real happy about this? They're real happy that they're underspending on education for poor kids in the state. They're proud of it. The problem is that Texas works backwards instead of going forward. What I mean by that is, is Texas comes up with a number that they want to spend in education, and then everything works backwards from that. Instead of thinking empirically, what is it going to take to provide an adequate, high-quality education for kids? What does that cost? And then work forward, right? These statistical models that we use, so what economists will do is they'll take a big bucket and they'll throw everything in that bucket, and then they'll say, oh, nothing matters because I put every single variable in the book in this statistical model, and nothing matters for you know, achievement, right? One of the things that um, I also did with Oscar for the, his journal, uh, the American Mexican American, you know, that journal, um, was we looked at what factors in primarily Latino schools predicted achievement. Basic regression models, coefficients. What coefficients allow you to do is, if you spend this much more money, how much more test score do you get? That's how statistical models work. What we found was is that it, the schools that had the biggest bang for their buck in terms of spending was class size reduction, which makes sense to you educators. If you have 35 knuckleheads versus 20 knuckleheads, it's a lot more manageable situation, right? But then there's those people out there saying, well, class size doesn't matter either. But there are a set of empirically based strategies. We have decades of research on these issues. I, uh, I went to the NAACP conference this, this summer, and one of the NAACP officials said that he talked to one of the folks from Singapore, and he said, what accounts for your dramatic rise uh, over the last 30 or 40 years in Singaporean education? He said, well, there's a variety of things, but you know, Americans, they do a lot of research. We looked at that research, and we implemented it here in Singapore. <laughs> so the thing is, is that there, we know there are empirically based solutions that we know make a difference. Money does matter. What are some of those things? Here in San Antonio, you have a promised neighborhood, right? Is, am I incorrect in saying that? And that, what that does is you have community liaisons that allow schools and different organizations across the city to uh, communicate about services that students in poverty need. That costs money. Certified, experienced teachers, that costs money. Michigan just record, recruited a new coach that cost the University of Michigan $5 million. Because when you want talent, whether it be teacher talent or principal talent, that's going to cost you money. But all of a sudden, those mark, folks that talk about markets, when we start, start talking about attracting high quality teachers and high quality principals, market principals go out the window. If you want high quality teachers, high quality principals, or you want to recruit them away from other places, you have to provide resources to do so. Guidance counselors. When I was in the Valley doing a study on, on something we called the confianza, the trust that ELL students' parents have in schools to do the right thing for their kids, we found one school that had two counselors that focused specifically on ELLs. But we know what's really going on with counselors in this state. You might have five or six counselors for several thousand students in some high schools, right? But this school specifically set aside two counselors to do essentially seminars for ELL parents for each year, because there's information that ELL parents have to know. How many of your parents could read a report card? Come on, raise your hand. How many of your parents could read a re your report card? OK. One of the things is that in Latin America, the grading scale is different than we have here. And so a lot of ELL parents can't read report cards, but schools often assume that they can. But this is the sort of information that these 
guidance counselors would provide to freshman parents of ELLs, to sophomore parents of ELLs. Money buys that resource. Uh, there's curriculum and technology. There's um, a newcomer school. I've, I'm on a, a Lotte board uh, with a project out of um, um, uh, West Ed looking at the newcomer school in Fort Worth. And, and I think Dr. Savage mentioned this. And this is a, a school for students who are, are recently arrived. And when I went to the school, there was a set of dictionaries in the middle of the table in 12 languages. I was blown away. An incredible school. Incredible teachers, incredible leaders. But Fort Worth has, is spending millions of dollars on this newcomer school. Right? So there is a set of, and, and there's, a, there's a history of research at newcomer school. Pei Lee recently wrote a study at newcomer schools. So all the things that I'm talking about are empirically based. These are things that, that we have to make commitments in terms of resources to, but we know that you'll get bang for your buck. So thank you for your time. I'm so glad that I was able to schlep it here from California. I just recently finished my second tour of duty in, in Texas. And I, and I hope and one quick thing is that my, my grandmother was born in Luling, Texas, right here in Bear County. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm home. But I try not to come back to Texas too often because all my exes live in Texas. <laughs> We, we actually have some good time for some good questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Vasquez, I think, needs to go back to Austin. He has to testify this afternoon. So you might first ask questions of him and then any of the other uh, panelists. So any questions out there? Good, sharp questions. They covered everything we understand. Please go ahead. It would seem that one of the major factors for ELL secondary students mm -hmm. who are struggling with English and also trying to pass their content courses and exams are competent, qualified, committed Spanish-speaking content teachers. Are our universities producing these graduates, or are we so focused on elementary that we don't understand that these young people and the struggles they're having, often leading to their dropping out of school because it's just so difficult? Mr. Kaufman, I'm going to ask um, that those who choose to speak use the microphone for recording purposes as well as auditory purposes uh, in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Want to repeat that question real quickly? Sure. 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 Sure is the availability of competent, dedicated, Spanish-speaking, that is, bilingual faculty in content areas. And I just wonder if our universities are producing these graduates or if the focus on elementary, which is clearly very important also, we don't have the people to help our high school kids. My husband, may he rest in peace, was a high school teacher, and he spoke about his frustration when he would have three or four absolute non-English speaking students in his class and there was no way he could ignore the 29 other students that he was trying to teach and yet those students either wouldn't take the test or they would fail. Okay, I would like to answer. Um, right now at this time, um, what is required for secondary is teachers to be ESL certified in the middle school setting and then in high school setting, it's sheltered instruction. Now, it depends on what you're looking in terms of sheltered instruction. Many districts are doing SIOP, which is a sheltered instruction observation protocol. And depending on where you go, if you go through Pearson or through the regional service center, it's a, a couple of days of training. Um, so it, the only time you're gonna have bilingual certified, content certified teachers is if you're doing a dual language program. So like, for example, in our case, we have it at sixth grade. And so our teachers are content bilingual certified in, in Spanish as well as in their content area. But um, other than that, unless they're um, in most programs, it's ESL at secondary level. So you're only going to see the ESL certified teacher in a pullout or content based in middle school. And then secondary, it's right now it's just required to do shelter instruction. So I, so I think one of the biggest problems is that we are often thinking about what it is that's going on in teacher ed programs. And right now, the Obama administration is really focused on this. But the, 
the real issue is that in Texas, 60% of all new teachers are alternatively certified teachers, which means that in Texas, you can have as little as 30 hours before you enter the classroom. And one of the things we found in that triple segregation study is guess who gets those most, and Harlandale, I think, is a, uh, is one of those exceptional districts in, in this state. And, and the, I don't know if he's still the current superintendent, but he was a CSP -er that I taught at, at UT. Um, so there are some exceptions to this, but 60% of all new teachers are the alt certs, and ELLs are more likely, and, and not to pick on certain folks, but I know that, okay, I won't, I won't pick on them today, but there's an organization that has three letters in their, their name, and it's an abbreviation. And they'll give their teachers that are going to go teach ELLs half a day of training to teach ELLs. They get five weeks of summer training. And in that five weeks of summer training, they get a half a day to teach ELLs. And so that's one of the real issues is that you know, the, the institutions of higher education are under assault. But what we really need to be thinking about is these alt certs. A place like Houston is drawing from between 100 and 120 different alt cert programs. And they're very heterogeneous in terms of their quality. Right, so I think you know there is. I think there's. It is an important conversation that we need to. And there's a second piece of this. We need to ensure that when we graduate teachers from Cal State, or UT Austin, you teach, etc., that when they get to the schools, that they also want to stay. Now, there's a debate over whether that attrition out of the schools is somewhere between 30 and 50 percent, because we actually train enough teachers in higher education to fill our schools. But the problem is that when they get there. The situations that the teachers encounter, they think to themselves, I don't think I'm going to stay. And so we have to think about how do we change the conditions in which the teachers are working, their work, not just pay conditions, but the types of buildings. I mean, you can, you know how this is. You, you, the kids know. You talk to these ELL kids. One kid told me that they send us to burro schools. The kids know that there's an, an unequal system of provision of education. They know that they're getting the short end of the stick. It's very clear to them. Yes, Dr. Scott, we have a question uh, from someone who's streaming live in the Rio Grande Valley. This is from Mike Seifert. Here in the RGV, hugely grateful to IDRA's work on this issue and so many more. Um, wish we could be there. Thanks for this gift. And uh, Mike uh, posts this question for the panel. We'd love to hear some models of success from other parts of the nation. Who is doing this the right way? I don't know who's doing it the right way, but I think a lot of us, one of the things I wanted to tack on to the other question was partnerships are very important because working with universities to get the qualified certified teachers. Um, and I know in partnerships with just even the lake and other universities that I've been working with, we let them know what we want in terms of certified teachers and those types of things. But the other thing I think that's important as well is the plan that's in place and for students. So um, if they're going into a secondary setting, there has to be a transition plan for students in terms of if they're going to this campus, um, what classrooms are they going to be going into, who is certified with that sheltered instruction as well as ESL certified. Um, it shouldn't just be, we'll put them here because check, this is what is minimal of what we have to do. There really needs to be a plan in place, what that looks, what that looks like, um, and teachers need to be planning too. They need to look at their data, look at the students that are coming in. If they're getting recent arrivals, who are those exemplary teachers that are willing to use those effective needs for the students, their cognitive, the linguistic needs that are wanting to support? Because I'll be quite honest, we can put students in a classroom and they're not going to flourish if the teacher is not willing to support them. And so we know um, as administrators, as principals that are here, you know who are those teachers that are exemplary teachers. You have to place them with the teachers who are going to support them. A lot of times teachers just want to put them with the student who's going to translate for them, especially at the secondary setting. That is not that is one mode of support. There's so many other strategies that are, that are out there. But then also, how do we then bring in the teachers that um, that we can build the teachers. So we have new teachers. What type of support are they going to need so that they're working with the students and know how to support them? 
At our district, we've started kind of a module series, so we're kind of doing it in chunks. We've learned that doing a day is not enough, so we're kind of doing like 45 minutes during PLCs. We do after school maybe an hour, um, where we're kind of giving segments of different pieces that are important because we they shut down after so much time, but also implementing those strategies that are important that we want to see them in the classroom. And then as administrators, um, working with them to see, okay, what are some things that you can add to your walkthrough forms? Because it has to be a joint effort. It can't just be a one-sided bilingual ESL department is doing it all. It has to be a joint effort with leadership at the campuses. I, I would also check out the newcomer school in Fort Worth. Uh, it's a school that I visited a, a couple of times. Uh, I've also blogged about it on cloaking and equity. I think the post is called This School is Lovely. So check out that, the Fort Worth Newcomer School. Related to the question about teacher certification and getting those best prepared teachers, um, I think Julian is, is absolutely right in terms of sort of some fundamental issues that we need to address before we start sort of critiquing too heavily teacher education programs. But I think if we look at sort of teacher education, we need to, there's an underlying issue that I think is important is that we need to go sort of beyond compliance-based responses to serving English language learners, right? So in teacher education, why do we not? So the answer is no, we don't have those, right? So the, the meaning the Spanish speaking, high quality Spanish speaking teachers that will deliver native instruction that would be helpful in a new cover program or other type of program. So why don't we have them is because the state does not require it. And it's sort of higher education works a lot like K-12, where if it's not tested, it's not taught, in higher education, if it's not mandated, then we're not going to allocate resources in terms of faculty and students and programs to do that. So I think, and right now, at least in Arizona, the Arizona Department of Education, which is not the friendliest to English language learners, sort of needs to approve what type of uh, teacher program you actually serve. And right now, we have a segregated four-hour block model. And so all the training is how to segregate ELLs for four hours and that is the training that they receive based on the mandates of the state. So I think sort of us as a community and pushing our institutions to go beyond the compliance-based model I think is really important. It's a real important issue talking about teacher preparation. Um, Ed, our BESSEL organization here at Our Lady of the Lake and the one also at UTSA, we have three training programs in San Antonio that are really looking at training bilingual teachers at three different universities. And this year we're taking it to the national level because that pipeline is being squeezed off. And so because we're transitioning children so early to English, a lot of children aren't coming to school prepared to use the academic Spanish. So when they get to college, they're not looking to going into fields in where they speak Spanish. So our pipeline of teachers, so although the numbers of ELLs are increasing across the state and across the nation, we are not training teachers fast enough. Not that the universities don't want to train them fast enough. Um, we just don't have the numbers coming in to train them fast enough. And so that is exactly looking at only the K through six levels. And so when we look at the secondary levels and, and what is required in the classrooms, um, listening to what Veronica is talking about, we work real closely with Harlandale and what they're doing over there um, they're not required to. So we're not teaching in Spanish. Only our dual language programs are doing that. And I believe there's only three districts in the city currently right now that even have secondary programs that are dual language. And then they're having a very hard time sustaining those programs because they do not have the content area teachers to teach. But it's not required. And then also looking at state assessment at the BTLPT and looking at the numbers of failure rates. Um, and how difficult those exams are and getting students to pass those exams in order just to become qualified bilingual teachers. It's a separate question. Does someone, is that okay? Go on. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Rebecca Baquero. I handle the education initiatives for Mayor Ivy Taylor. And I'm also a former GD ESL teacher in SAISD. Yay, and proud graduate of SASD. 
Um, so my question is about what is our responsibility in terms of the institutions you represent, school districts, universities, et cetera, um, our responsibility in terms of also providing ESL classes to the parents and getting them into the workforce because, of course, there's a direct co correlation um, in terms of the education level, the income, in the household of how the kids do um, academically in classroom. I'm going to take a quick answer to that one. Uh, my wife, Olga Kaufman, just came in and she used to try to coordinate uh, uh, GED classes, you know, for Spanish speakers, and the city has cut off the funding for those. So one thing the city could do is to find the funding to help those. I mean, if those people can then find jobs, that would be very helpful on them helping their families. So, I mean, I know it's not your pers personal issue. This happened before uh, Mayor I Ivy Taylor was even the mayor, or even on the city council, but it is a long-term issue. We do have um, two programs at Harlando. One is an ESL program, and then we also have another program that is a Spanish program uh, for computer skills. And so one thing that we'll be adding to that is now technology in terms of iPads. So I purchased iPads um, to do that. But again, it has to be supplemental, so it can only be for LEP students, you know, those types of things. But um, you have to be very careful you know, with Title I funds and those types of things because um, that is a parent involvement uh, program. So it's something I'm looking into making sure I'm not supplanting funds. But um, we do have an ESL and then we have the, the computer program. And then part of that is another program that teach, um, if that one's in Spanish as well, that teaches um, like financial um, support, um, it looks at uh, different types of, it's called Math and Maestro, and so we're, we're working with, with that as well, and that brings, has different components of just um, how to build um, families, and, and so the parents, and sometimes what's difficult is getting um, daycare, so I do have one parent who brings her baby with her, and so we kind of adjust to those types of things, and so, um, but it's something that's it's growing, and it's growing bigger, and, and the need for um, not just ELO parents, but other parents, um, have wanted to participate in those types of things, but it, it you know, it's a, it's a program that needs a lot of support because we don't have that partnership with our parents. Our parents are not going to feel welcome, and we're not going to have a successful program. Okay, um, the question I have deals with bilingual and also with special ed because you you, you mentioned both, but. Um, I always saw the need for bilingual LSSP, the licensed specialist in school psychology, because in order to qualify or to meet the criteria to qualify for special education, you have to qualify in both languages. And too many times, if a student was not being successful, they would uh, test them in English, and obviously, because they had a language issue, they wouldn't pass, and so you dump them in special ed. My question is, what progress is being made to uh, you know, in that area where, where you can get bilingual LSSPs or licensed specialists in school psychology to test for the uh, areas where they can identify students as special education students. Uh, but before you answer, because I noticed that when they asked about, uh, from that person from the uh, Rio Grande Valley about, uh, could you give us any models of successful programs? I noticed there was a, everybody was quiet. And uh, it reminded me of a comment that uh, Dr. Jose Cardenas made when he was superintendent at Edgewood. They asked him, well, does bilingual education work? And he, his response was, well, when I find one, I'll let you know. Because, uh, you know, who's doing it right? And I've never seen anybody really do it right. So when we find it, we'll change it. But in the meantime, my question is about the special ed uh, LSSPs. Because just because you know Spanish doesn't make you a bilingual teacher. Just because you know Spanish doesn't make you a bilingual LSSP to test uh, special uh, students for special ed criteria. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Moises Ortiz, and I'm the Senior Director for Special Programs in the San Antonio Independent School District. And having have been an ESL teacher as well as a middle school and high school principal and now from the district level, I think that this is a perfect segue into my question of not only teacher quality but the support that we're getting from the state and the possible, uh, and I'm not going to say gerrymandering, or the culture that has had to evolve 
because of the limitations that are put on the funding. So for example, we're talking about uh, just because you know ESL or Spanish doesn't make you a good ESL teacher. Uh, and that's simply the way it's written, and, and maybe that's the policy because when you get to the secondary level, we're talking about quality Spanish speakers in the classroom or, or teachers, but really at ESL instruction, and we're changing the demo demographics of ELLs, especially in San Antonio, are changing. We're now having to address multiple languages, Tagalog, Chinese, different forms of dialect, Iraqi, and so we can no longer rely on that bilingual model and there's no way we can ever plug a content or a language certified teacher in every content area in every language that we get. So I feel that that's why the state has now moved over into the PSYOP model. So for example, we talk about funding and both ladies up here have already addressed uh, Title I and then Title III and has anyone, and I'm, now I'm coming to the panel, addressed, has Texas or has anyone addressed the culture that has had to evolve as a result of the state not really funding because no one has said, oh, we pay for bilingual support or we pay for the tutors, we pay out of local funds, out of state funds. We're having to rely on federal funds to supplement, not supplant. So it's, it's a very slippery slope that we get into. And my question is, has anybody on the panel, has any of this uh, fiscal research uh, addressed that, uh, that need that has had to arrive from school districts? Wait, Mo Moises, could you restate the question in like one sentence for me? <laughs> <laughs> so as school districts, as practitioners, we are limited to the way we can use our funding. And the majority of the funding that comes towards bilingual and ESL programming is as a result of federal funding, not state funding. So it's created a very nebulous framework that can easily offset by expenditures from another side. Have you addressed that? I, I think that's a great question for Oscar. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, having been around the issue dating back to, well, when I was a child, but professionally since 1981, when I worked with teams that actually developed the framework for how we were going to address ELL issues, and the state mandate of what was going to be acquired, not by the feds, but by the state of Texas. At that time, there was a lot of information, clarity, specificity focused on the elementary level program. And even though we haven't spent a lot of time on that this morning, if we look at Texas's elementary level programs, they are among some of the better ones in many parts of the country. Certainly those that are uh, better funded are, are obviously producing much better results at the elementary level. When you cross over to the secondary level, when the designed for programs for middle and secondary level EL students were crafted back in 1981. There was very little information on what those programs should look like. What, what should teacher preparation look like? What should we do about content area uh, instruction? What kinds of resources and what kinds of guidelines for how those resources should be used? particularly at the secondary level, that level of specificity was not incorporated into that 1981 mandate that with some minor refinements is still the framework that we have in place today. So I think the question for the panel and the, and the audience this afternoon is what fundamental redesigns do we have to implement on a required state level basis. How do we change the secondary level program for middle and high school students that are English learners that produces much better results than we currently have today? And obviously that's gonna require policy changes in terms of both teacher preparation programs, but also uh, what some folks raised about, what do, we, what do we do about teachers that are currently in the field about strengthening their professional development opportunities so that they develop the skills 
particularly in the content areas that they might not currently have, and addressing the point that was made by Julian about what do we do to create opportunities and incentives to both recruit, excuse me, recruit, but also retain middle and high school level EL student, uh, EL uh, teachers that'll do a much more effective job. So again, what do we need to do differently at the secondary level, both from a policy perspective and a funding perspective, that'll create a better program than we have at that level now? So I throw that back to the group. I, I think your, your question about sort of uh, the creativity, if you will, that districts need to sort of uh, rely upon I think is indicative of the, under, the overall underfunding of public education, right? So what you see, especially, I don't know the stats here in, in Texas, but in Arizona, what we're seeing is a gigantic leap in the number of bonds and overrides that districts are trying to pass. Why? Because they don't have enough resources from the state to fund properly uh, fund their programs. Um, at Arizona State, we, we are very proud to say that we're increasing our endowment. But what does that really mean? That means we're going after private funds where, because the legislature is not funding our, you know, our higher institutions, higher education institutions. So I think this issue, and also related to federal funds in K-12, I think the, what I've seen in, in the work in, in Arizona is that that's why I focused on general funds and not total funds because of this issue. So if you actually analyze total funds, many times you see, wow, fun, the schools are, are fund pretty equally. You know, they're doing a really nice job. But the issue is that those federal funds, so meaning the state funding has decreased, but federal funding has increased, especially during the whole um, the American Recovery Act where there was a surplus of federal funding that went into districts, especially for Title I and, and Special Ed. So it sort of masked inequities. But now that those funds are sort of running out, those inequities are, are being seen. So I think that's part of the issue. I think the superintendent uh, brought up a really interesting point about the weight funding. And I think what, what my research is suggesting as well is that it's a minimum of a 0.5 weight. Um, a minimum. Um, why? Because there is the diversity and complexity of English language learners. So what I'm saying is at the base level, you know, your standard ELL should get that 0.5. However, I think what the conversation we could have and should have is, okay, how do we go more towards a special ed type of model where we actually differentiate, and it gets to Julian's point about Let's now work backwards, right? Let's look at what funding is needed and then look at waiting uh, as a secondary level. So I think the issue of how do we create a more nuanced funding way for English language learners, is, I think is one that's very relevant. Can I, can I pop in real quick here with a comment, which is something really, really exciting and cool. One of the reasons why I went to California is California has something they call now local accountability. It's something that the governor put into place because they have extra monies because the economy is doing better. What they've done is, is they've put uh, together the, uh, what they call local accountability plans or called LCAPs. And so there's a stick and a carrot now with accountability. In Texas, Accountability has been all stick for a couple of decades. Uh, there were some carrots early on in the 90s, but now those have gone away. And so what happens is, in California, is that you have to put together a plan specifically for ELLs, specifically for at-risk kids, and specifically for foster youth. And based on those local plans made at the county level, if you meet those goals on a set of criteria, not just test scores, because we're always talking about test scores, we're talking about student outcomes. We believe that tests are a proxy for what we care about in society, but it turns out tests are not a proxy for what we care about, which is incarceration, which is going to college, which is being employed in the workforce. Tests have nothing to do with any of those things that we really care about. And so 
uh, the districts can set up these plans and they get additional funds from the state if they meet their goals for ELLs, if they meet their goals for at-risk kids, and if they meet their goals for foster kids. And if you're interested, um, just go to my website, which is Cloaking Equity, look, uh, click on the community-based accountability link, and there's several pieces. And then we did a really specific statutory analysis in the Journal of Urban Education that talks about how California now has carrot to go with their stick in a local approach to accountability. Uh, just a couple of thoughts uh, in regard to accountability. I think it's important that whatever accountability mechanisms we move toward, that we don't move away from having data that allow us at a statewide level to know how our kids are doing. So for example, one of the big problems in knowing how English language learners in Texas are doing at the secondary level, is that the state of Texas merges secondary level data with elementary data, where we're doing a little bit better as a state. And we are unable to know how we're doing with ELL students at the secondary level. And from what we know, we know we are doing much worse. And so whatever we do in accountability, our next steps have to include accountability systems that do not hurt children, that don't have the kind of high stakes testing that Julian was talking about, but at the same time allow us to disaggregate and know how we're doing about groups of kids in the state. I think that's one important piece. The other is in terms of uh, promising practices. Despite the fact that Texas has had a lot of um, experience at this, if only because of our demography, uh, there are, I think, some states who are trying very good new approaches to how to educate teachers. So Minnesota, for example, Minnesota of all places, um, in their last round of, of uh, educational policy requires that every single teacher who is being prepared in the state of Minnesota receive training for English as a second language in the content areas. Minnesota can do this and Texas cannot, for heaven's sakes. So I think that there is much that can be done um, to make sure that kids learn that they have access to high quality teachers and that we have the data to continue to know how groups of kids are doing in our schools. Hi, uh, good morning, I would think. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, get out of the Rojas with the Office for Civil Rights. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my one is, uh, you have a great point in that uh, it's actually been that's been done in, in districts as well where there's been a, an issue about like uh, a new population going into a district or states and then not having any certifications or anything at the state level and then all of a sudden they find themselves needing to address these issues under title six and, and the EOA and they uh, some of the remedies has been to train all the teachers in content areas. Um, that's just for the district. Obviously, it gets a lot more complicated as you get out into the state. But my uh, observation kind of question uh, regarded the evaluation component of the uh, language programs. As you all know, uh, well, our policy uh, really requires that the uh, educational program, the EOL program, be evaluated after having been tried for a period of time. And in my experience, when we've been out there, we ask about, okay, where's your evaluation? You haven't been in uh, research and evaluation, and, and uh, usually they direct us to the very back office. <laughs> and then, uh, it's just fine. And then there's all this data, which is kind of goes back to your point also about, you do all the research, but somebody else uses it. And so that's one, 
the observation is that the data is there, sometimes the research is there, but it doesn't make it quite back to make those modifications that are required basically under Title VI to make your program work or work better than what your goal. I mean, you need to be adjusting your goals consistently and constantly in accordance with what is working, what isn't working. The only way you're going to get it is through that evaluation data and using it. And there's a lot of binders out there that we see. A lot of times when you get up to the, and ask the bilingual director or you ask the superintendent, well, what's changed? What's happened? You get the shoulder shrug. And I was just wondering, what are the dynamics of that from the superintendent's viewpoint, from your research and development standpoint, bilingual director standpoint? How does that all come together in real life? Give me a quick synopsis of, of the question, if you if you don't mind. I was playing I was playing with my iPhone. I'm sorry. I apologize. Research and evaluation. Uh, like, you know, it's a you have a you have a research and evaluation uh, staff, right? And part of it, I suppose, would be to to evaluate your EOL programs. And so I'm trying to find out what what are the dynamics? How does that work as far as uh, the assignment being given uh, to the research uh, component, please evaluate our program, and then following up and saying, okay, so what's working, what's not working, let's change this, let's change this uh, or that. Our goal was this initially, our goals are these. Because sometimes that doesn't come across as clearly perhaps as, as sometimes districts think that it's happening. Sure. <laughs> That's by the EOL program, for the EOL program as a whole. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the comments that Kuka made in reference to the, the availability of data being so important. Um, and, and actually, I appreciate her comments. I'm going to get back to what you just said, but, but I appreciate her comments because there's a strong anti-testing movement in the state of Texas right now, frankly, all over the country. And uh, I think we need to be real careful before we jump on that bandwagon, because it's going to hurt minority kids, poor kids. Uh, my point of view on, on that issue, it's, it's a middle class issue. Uh, it's not a, a, an issue for, for, for poor kids, um, or, or that will be of, of great value for, for poor kids. Yes, testing has gotten, uh, high stakes testing has gotten out of line, and that needs to be brought back in. Totally understand that. But we should never advocate for stopping the accountability system. Because that's one of the main things that has turned things around uh, for, for poor kids in, in the state of Texas. But beca because of that data that's available due to the accountability system, um, and because of high stakes testing or high stakes accountability, you know, you always look at when you disaggregate data, you look at your various categories of kids, including ELL kids, as to what specifically are they not doing so well in. And especially in a district like Houston that has a large research uh, department, of, uh, you know, you start zeroing in in those deficiencies, and and through the you know through the, through research you try to find out what exactly are they are they not perform where are they not performing well. Matter of fact, the the comment I made earlier about opening up the newcomers high school, uh, it was through data that we realized that that. Um, that the population that we had at that point was a different older population that needed, frankly, a new setting, a different setting uh, in, in, to educate these kids. Uh, but it's, it's through that research that you're able to, to identify that, but you, need it, you, but you definitely need that data to be able to, to do that. I want to, uh, as a point of order, we need to uh, wrap up and move on. Um, most of you are going to be at, in our table conversations. Um, and I would ask you to extend any other comments at that point in time, as well as those of you here who may have comments. Be sure to add them to your table and what you'll be discussing uh, during this period from now through the end of lunch. Uh, we have three things to do, one of which is um, to get our lunches. We need to bring closure to this segment, get our lunches, which are here, and um, spend about 15 minutes um, uh, not only uh, refreshing yourselves and, and, and that sort of thing, eating your lunches, but then to reconfigure yourselves uh, into 
uh, conversation. So you've heard a lot of research, you've heard a lot of practitioners. Uh, we're hoping that it has given you an opportunity to really whet your thinking and to, th and to think about what we need to do to provide equity and excellence for English language learners at the secondary level. But now, it's, this is your time to begin to talk and to bring together some of the best of your thinking at your tables about what you feel from your own points of view, from wherever it is that you come um, to, um, to this issue, to this question. Ron Edmonds, we were talking about Kozo, but Ron Edmonds reminded us more than uh, almost 40 years ago that we already know everything we need to know to educate any child whose education is of interest to us. You know, so the question really is, who do we really care about? And uh, do or legislators and, and other folks, other stakeholders, care enough about students, in this case, English language learners at the secondary level, um, 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 students anywhere they may be found, care enough about them and what's going on with them to make the right decisions to support their um, um, excellence in terms of their academic outcomes.